Good morning, everybody. Um, this is workshop number 452, Community Governance in an Age of Platform Responsibility. So if you're here for that, welcome. If you're not here for that, also welcome. Please stay. Um, you made it here. You might as well stay. Um, my name is Jan Gerlach. I'm a senior public policy manager at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the organization that hosts and supports um, Wikipedia. I'm joined here today by my co-organizers, Anna Mascal from the Free Knowledge Advocacy Group EU and Jorge Vargas, also from the Wikimedia Foundation, and by um, my four speakers, um, Juliette Namfuka from CIPESA, Abby um, Volmer from GitHub, Yochai Benavi from Mozilla, and Xian Hong Hu from UNESCO. Um, the topic of this session um, is, um, as the title says, community governance, uh, models of community self-governance on the internet as well. Um, and I just want to give a very quick um, overview of what, we're, what this is meant to be. Um, we, all of you are seeing probably um, increased pressures um, and appetite of uh, policymakers to regulate platforms sort of top down to um, really um, change intermediary liability regimes to make um, internet platforms, websites, um, police what is going on on their, on their platforms, uh, content, behavior, um, to comply with local norms, national laws. Um, we've um, also heard about this from Emmanuel Macron two days ago. Um, there's, there's a clear a tendency to really um, make the internet work again. Um, whatever that means, um, to, to, to rebuild trust, um, as the title of the IGF here also suggests. Um, and at the Wikimedia Foundation, we see this uh, with um, growing concerns. Um, on Wikipedia, people have built policies for themselves, how they want to write a Wikipedia, uh, an online encyclopedia, how they want to interact. Um, and they've done this before the Wikimedia Foundation actually was established. Um, people on Wikipedia talk to each other about policies every day, how they should govern themselves as a community and also the platform. And we really believe that the law, that policy and regulation should leave room for this. Um, because the internet really gives us the opportunity to self-organize, to um, agree or disagree, but find common ground on, on policies that make the internet work and that make the internet a trustworthy place. Um, so today with my speakers, I want to discuss um, in, a, in a conversation um, that should also include everybody here in the room because there's a lot of expertise, obviously. Um, <coughs> how such self-governance models on the internet can look, how they are developed, um, how communities police, um, what, what um, doesn't work also maybe for self-governance, um, because sometimes a platform may have to step in because something goes, it goes bad. Um, and we want to talk about how conflicts are, are resolved, um, all within an hour, um, and what this means for users and, and cohorts online, like what does this mean for freedom of expression, for agency of, of uh, people who, who want to help build um, the internet um, and make it grow and continue um, to be a, a flourishing place. Um, so I think we, we can go ahead and jump right into a, a discussion of this. Maybe um, my four speakers can briefly introduce themselves first. Um, we, we are not going to have um, panel-like statements. We, it's just going to be a, a conversation. And I invite everybody in the room to just um, raise your hand if you have a question, a comment, and really be a part of this conversation here. Do we want to start? <laughs> Good morning. My name is Yochai Benavi. I'm the Senior Global Policy Manager at Mozilla. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jude Namfukand. I work with the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa. Yes, it's a mouthful, but <laughs> otherwise known as CIPESA. Why didn't you warn us? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to use this, this one? Uh, my name is Xian Hong uh, from UNESCO from here. Welcome everybody to the house and I wish we have a very interesting discussion. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Abby Vollmer. I'm the Senior Policy Manager at GitHub. And fire and power was combined. What's that? <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so I've talked um, just very briefly about um, Wiki, Wiki, the Wikipedia community as, self, as a self-organizing body, actually also in real life where people meet, um, not only online. And I um, want to take this opportunity of, of um, having Abby here um, working at GitHub where there's um, also a community of, of people who really build things. Um, and 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 ask you how how the GitHub community um, has maybe developed and and what um, and and what um, the model is um, that they follow or maybe there are many models that people on on GitHub follow. Yeah. So um, in case there's there are people listening or here in the room that don't know <coughs> GitHub, it's a software development platform. It's where most software developers build software um, and. Building software um, is actually quite a complex process, or it can be, involving potentially thousands of people, even millions of people, I suppose, um, who can collaborate online on projects. And I'm saying at a very top level just so that I can get into the community moderation part of it. Basically, when you're collaborating on the internet, it means that people from everywhere can be able to contribute to that project and whoever's maintaining that project, um, which we refer to as the maintainer, is the person who is in charge of moderating what happens in that project. And so at GitHub, we try to help maintainers, empower maintainers to be able to moderate effectively. And one thing that's really helpful about open source communities and the rest of the world using the internet is there's a lot of similarity between what people are trying to achieve. We want an open, inclusive, um, vibrant platform that's free of abuse. And that's also what maintainers want for open source projects. They want a lot of people to be contributing. They want people to feel comfortable there. They want an inclusive group of participants. And so in terms of um, how this model might be useful in other discussions, I think there is something there. Um, one point to maybe um, just to be fair about how applicable, I think that it's useful for open source maintainers that everybody who's in their project is generally trying to build software. And so that is a sort of self-selecting group that's fairly unified in a lot of what they're trying to achieve. And if you compare that to some of the other platforms that are more general use, it's, it may be harder to kind of set rules that everybody's sort of, you know, going to get behind. Um, so I think that said, I, I want to give other people a chance to speak, but, but um, setting rules, being clear about what the rules are, being clear about enforcement and all that sort of thing, um, I, I'll get into that more as we all talk. But th those are the kind of level of um, principles that I think could be useful elsewhere. So the, the <clears throat> maybe the dichotomy between general purpose platforms versus like um, specific platforms for building software or building an encyclopedia um, is, is, is what you're describing, sort of makes a difference here. Um, I, I wonder, Yochai, whether you want to speak on this because obviously Mozilla also um, is about open source but doesn't run its own platform in a strict sense. Um, your, your, it's it's your, always yes, it's always it's no. Always no. I, I think, you know, a, a sort of high level observation is, you know, we, I think the law certainly used to conceive of, and many jurisdictions still conceives of sort of company develops product, company has liability for product, right? And I think that we're seeing a wave of companies, um, big and small, who are, are adapting open source into their core business practices, into their core product development. And so we're seeing that, you know, even you know, Microsoft, you know, probably the sort of exemplar of proprietary software at a certain age of internet history, you know, really adapting to open source models. We see this in Facebook and some of their projects. We see, you know, Android at the end of the day is an open source project. Um, but I think, you know, and so we need to sort of evolve some of our thinking in the law and in policy around sort of the, the liability structures there and, and about sort of how do we do that. But I think it's also important to be really thoughtful about what's your contribution model. Um, you know, Android, uh, Mozilla, Signal, um, 
Drupal, you know, Rust are all open source projects, but have very different contribution models, right? Um, and there are a lot of benefits to, to being an open source project. And so, for example, Signal, which is, which is open source, has said that, you know, their use of the GPL 3.0 license is primarily for quality control. Right, and to give people a sense of you know trust in the product that they can sort of take a look at that code, but they you know you're you're going to be for a product like Signal really hard pressed to find someone who has as much um, commitment and driven mission to sort of really delivering on the product roadmap of you know that mass market product, and that's going to be different than something like Rust's, um, which is by its nature sort of a very wide open project where you know the sort of the maintainers and primary developers, you know, are generally willing to pay a pretty high opportunity cost in terms of code not written or other things not done in order to help onboard new contributors in order to sort of bring folks into the project, help them to sort of give insight into design thinking, um, and just sort of one other sort of example of a sort of Drupal, you know, as uh, a sort of really, you know, our WordPress is also sort of in this model, right, of like pretty diverse ecosystem, a lot of people contributing code, writing core pieces of the core functionality, um, where you sort of at the end, you have a lot of really great sort of governance models, you have committees that deal with sort of different, that provide an escalation pathway, that deal with challenging circumstances, and at the end of the day, there's like a benevolent dictator, you know, <laughs> who, who sort of says at the end of the day, like, th this is the way it's going to be if, you know, the community governance can't sort it out. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll pause there and uh, we'll come back. Thanks, Yochai. Um, so, and I'm, I'm wondering though, what are different governance models? And we, we've heard about two different pieces of, of open source um, communities, or many actually. Um, are there any, any other um, governance models for, for communities that we can think of that we also see out there? I, I, I sometimes wonder how, um, or about research into actual Facebook groups who within them have a, uh, they have a founder, a benevolent dictator in a way, but within them, what's, what is the model in those groups, how people interact? Are there, are there similar um, models that we see in there or on other platforms that um, theoretically have a very top-down approach with terms of service, with um, also policies um, that evolve a lot um, and, and that make it sometimes hard for, for communities or to people um, who find and each other on these platforms to, to know what they can say. Um, and we don't always have to think about actual bad things, but I mean, we all know about, about um, Facebook deleting uh, pictures of, of um, breasts or nipples, like that you, things that you cannot show, right? Um, so are, is there room for this? Do we see sp models where, where communities can, within those platforms, self-organize to a certain degree? Maybe, San Hong, have you, have you um, do you see this? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Wikipedia, for, I mean, raising this interesting topic and also interesting a new notion about the community governance. Um, Internet uh, it seems not just a renovation of a technology, but also the experiment of a governance models. We already heard many. Um, there are several aspects uh, we can think about it. Uh, I work at UNESCO mostly on the internet uh, freedom, internet governance, but I used to be a media person. I had, I had a pa I, I'm still having a passion for journalism. Uh, so if you look at in the history, how the media and, and then media content was governed before the internet, uh, they also have a quite uh, uh, constructive self-regulation uh, self model. Uh, you know, we always say media should be independent, should be free, should be pluralistic. But how you, gar how you gar guarantee that? Um, one challenge is to make media independent from any pressure, whether from governments or from the commercial uh, force. So. There, we have seen in many countries, in the Nordic, in some other, uh, in Africa, even also in, in Asia as well, there is a press council, the independent media council, and also journalism association, they were compiled. It's like your community um, structure to, uh, when, once there's a complaint from the readers about uh, the content, uh, it's up to this community, this self-regulated, um, I mean this um, um, press council consisting, consisting of all the 
uh, other experts and the journalists to decide uh, whether we should uh, apologize for fake news or whether. Uh, but that mechanism seems not completely applying to the digital um, age because if you ask us um, Facebook, uh, social media, they don't recognize themselves as a sort of media, right? And then if you ask, uh, I mean, the user-generated content also distinguish from those content uh, produced by the professional journalists. Uh, you ask uh, uh, social media users, uh, you should uh, about yourself to the professional and ethical standards of a journalist. It seems not a real realistic either. Uh, and then uh, and now we have seen the trend that many social media platforms are oh, we are having a self-regulation by the company and they are allocating thousands of staff to to work on the media, uh, to work on the content and moderation. Not to mention now the trend is as everybody seems to have, ah, look, uh, the artificial intelligence, the, 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 the algorithm, the automated process can be even more effective in handling so many uh, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, all kinds of man manipulation of content. Um, there are many problems into this, uh, this um, still, you see the nature is quite a top-down uh, approach. Uh, you, that's why I, from here I see this, this the, the power of this sort of uh, very bottom-up process as the open source uh, software, as the Wikipedia has practiced, it seems uh, show us a new way, it really depend on the grassroots uh, users, the people who own their content, who produce the code, who invent this content to, to decide uh, in, in a collective way what should be the proper content um, information flow on the internet. Uh, so I think it's a quite um, uh, positive approach to it. And also it um, uh, gives me some thought to think about the so-called multi-stakeholder approach. I mean, it's a fuzz word uh, here at the forum. UNESCO also certainly we have been advocating internet to be based on human rights, to be open, to be driven by the multi-stakeholder uh, approach. But when we talk about multi-stakeholder approach, we very often we discuss at the global level, at the national level, but a very not so often we think about the community, I mean local level. So that's also, I think, if you want to advance this approach, should, you should really get the community, the, the users, individuals, to be in this process. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> um, the room, well, the speakers are over there, so maybe a little bit, yeah. Um, I think we can work through this. Um, thanks so much for this. Um, Juliet, uh, maybe as taking the last thought that Xian Hong had um, about um, local content, local uh, local context, um, you work very much on a regional context in a context with CEPESA. Um, what what are some of the of the challenges to 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 governance models, community governance that you see in in, in your region, which is southern and e in eastern Africa? Uh, I think I will speak more to what Jean Hong had just said in your previous question as well, for jumping on to that. Um, you spoke of what is happening within the platforms, what's, how are people self-regulating, self-governing in those spaces. Um, we see a lot of excitement. Um, sorry, I didn't mention when I introduced myself that we, <laughs> I'm involved in research and communications at CIPESA, so I monitor, I love, I'm like a fly on the wall, I love watching what's happening. And what we see is um, a lot of excitement when people open up a space um, or community online. Um, but what they underestimate is the amount of time that goes into or that's required to ensuring that the space is safe, that it's not taken over by other individuals, that it, one, remains, you know, comfortably within the Facebook, um, you know, in this instance, Facebook um, community standards before it also remains a safe space for whatever the nature of the content that's being posted in that space is. Um, so I'll take the example of a group set up to a community of journalists online who also have, you know, they're following the traditional um, journalism codes of conduct and um, ethics and principles, but while they'll do it in the traditional practice, they won't do it online. Online things will get violent, <laughs> the language will get very, 
very fiery. The content will also be very far from what you'd otherwise expect from a journalist. And quite often we see that the community or the group of individuals who had established that space are not sure of how to deal with the content in that instance. In some cases, you will see a bit of an argument emerging between the owners of um, some of uh, these groups. So it shows that there's still a bit of uncertainty on how to actually manage this space as a community, even if it's just a small group of people of about, say, 500 people. Um, so that plays out in the greater scheme of things as well. Who should do what? Who should have the power to remove, to point out um, irregular content? Um, and what happens thereafter? Um, and we are looking at spaces where people tend to know each other, so there's also that dynamic of physically interac interacting with some of these people. Of course, there's also a gender dynamic. We'll find a lot of these groups set up, but with a very male-dominated um, type of content coming through. There's, uh, I keep referring back to this group of journalists. It's a journalism group, but half of the time the content is the latest scores on soccer and nobody is calling that out. When somebody brought up an issue around the state of journalists, they were removed from the group, and nobody s spoke out on it. So it shows that even the community of people within the group are not too clear on what um, the nature of content should be, even though it's clear in the title, Safety of Journalists in East Africa. Um, so there's a bit of digital literacy that perhaps is required, a bit of maybe common sense, which we choose not to exercise in some of these spaces. Um, but also I think that the greater national um, regulatory context also fuels the type of content, the type of narrative that's in, introduced in, this, in such spaces. So we see quite a bit of self-censorship on key issues. Um, when an issue is brought up, someone will be called out about talking about it. You'll get arrested. That is unsafe to say. Um, or it's an immediate delete or an attack, a very blatant attack from the other members of the group. So there's still a bit of uncertainty, even though the idea of a governance model from the bottom up is appreciated, how to go about it still remains up in the air for some of the spaces that I've seen. How to go about it is, um, I'm wondering, is there a general recipe for building community policies? I know that's a, that's a, that's sort of a curveball here, but at Mozilla, you do an internet health report, you work a lot on internet openness, so you have a very, I'd say, very broad horizon where mm -hmm. you um, just monitor what's going on. Um, and is there, is, there a, is there something that this is how communities develop? Is there, is there something like that? You mentioned different open source communities, um, but at the broader um, scope, is there, is there a recipe for this? I mean, I think picking up on something Abby was saying earlier, you know, I think there are some best practices here, right, around, you know, documenting, you know, sort of what is the purpose, like what is, you know, and sort of what's bringing you together so that's something you can refer back to later. You know, what is the actual sort of governance model um, for that? You know, who, who sort of is empowered? What are the escalation pathways? You know, having a code of conduct is important, but almost as important is like, who do you report violations to? What happens when someone violates it? Um, and, you know, I think being clear about that. I think, you know, some of our other organizations here are, are, are pretty radically open, which is kind of interesting to sort of see, like, what does, what does that look like, um, especially at scale? Um, for those of you interested, like, Mozilla uses, like, a module system, which is, like, a kind of clunky word to say, like, there are a lot of different parts of the Mozilla project that have owners and peers who need not necessarily be Mozilla, you know, corporation employees or Mozilla Foundation employees. If you look at the Mozilla public license, for example, the first, the MPL1 was written by Mitchell Baker, our, you know, one of our founders and our executive chairwoman. Most of the development of MPL2 was done by Louis Villa, who, at, you know, has worked at Mozilla, has also worked at the Wikimedia Foundation, no longer works for Mozilla, but he's still a peer of that module and still contributes at a sort of, you know, high level, and especially if there was an escalation. You know, if you were to raise a question about the MPL, Louis, Louis might be like a better person to talk to than Mitchell, um, and I think she would say that. <laughs> um, 
And if you're interested, you can join our governance mailing lists where we talk about things. Um, so you know, I, I think that there's a certain amount of process. I think there's a certain amount of you know being thoughtful about the structure. So um, we released earlier this year a sort of open source archetypes um, report um, that sort of lays out different types of open source projects and sort of how you know your contributor community looks differently, how the incentives are different. Um, and so I, I would say you know first figure out what you want to do. And for different types of pr different products, different even different features, um, you know, different parts of what your organization is trying to do, you might have very different models um, and governance structures and policies and practices that fall off of that. Um, so I think that sort of intentionality is really important. And then document, communicate, seek feedback, iterate, repeat. <laughs> yeah, well, document especially, right? Make it, make, I mean, all of those things, but but uh, it when when I look at how um, Wikimedia communities govern themselves, documentation um, being inclusive for people, also time-wise, when you're in a distributed project around the world, different time zones, don't expect any an answer to your email within the next hour, right? Um, I think we've all kind of learned that this is not happening anymore, anyway. Um, but um, document what you're doing and, and give people time to read up on and, and to really be part of this. And if I can sure I have one more point, like engage the communities you're seeking to serve, right? And, and I think that they're even some of the best intentioned, you know, companies and organizations, you know, they're trying to do the right thing, they're trying to sort of move quickly, um, but trying to be thoughtful about, you know, who, who are we affecting how are they involved in the process? How are we building policies and practices that are driven by those users? And, and, and sometimes you see like pretty high profile um, missteps. <laughs> you know, I think when we look, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with some of the struggles that, you know, Facebook has had in Myanmar. When you don't have any, you know, content moderators in Myanmar uh, who speak Burmese, that you're going to run into some challenges. And I think we could probably point to other examples in, in many other uh, countries as well. Um, yeah, I, I think I don't want to bash on Facebook here, but it, it's a very prominent example, obviously. What strikes me is that so in our first round of, 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 of our conversation here, we've always talked about very like specific purpose uh, project, right? Um, open source development in different ways. You mentioned journalism or, or the media in general and, and how journalists um, basically organize within Facebook. But this really makes me wonder, is there even room for a large-scale general purpose platform with a self-governing community? Is there even room for that? Because that's basically what we at the Wikimedia Foundation talk about a lot. It's not general purpose, but that even large-scale communities can self-govern on a platform. But is that model sort of can that be transferred to a general purpose platform like Facebook, like Twitter, where will people um, be able to self-govern in that way um, and at that scale? Um, I wonder what, what you seem to have thoughts on this. Um, partly because I gave this disclaimer about, you know, maybe everything that I'm saying is easier for us because we have some self-selecting community members, but I do want to talk a lot about how the things that happen within open source communities can be useful, and I think um, for just in terms of the the layers of moderation, um, at the top level, I guess you can think about laws that are out there, mm -hmm. and then at a company like ours that's dealing with um, communities that are able to do some level of moderation on their own, we still find that the company itself our legal team will come in and do a layer of moderation on top of that. And I think that um, in, if communities are doing a good job, there are less opportunity or less need for legal teams of those platforms to do more, and there's less need for governments then to do more. And so I think, you know, to the purpose of this conversation, if we can help the communities do a very good job, there's less need for a lot of intervention all the way up. So I think in terms of that, we try to help our maintainers think about um, how to create welcoming communities and, and moderate effectively and give them tools to moderate effectively so that you don't need to have you know, various other 
interventions. And some examples of that are for moderators to think about other perspectives on their own within the communities that they're moderating, to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, assume you know people are there with good intentions, um, keep the conversation on topic, and if people are being um, you know harassing or monopolizing the conversation, to then intervene and try to just keep things productive and positive, um, to be clear and think about how whatever you're saying, whether it's rules or a decision about <coughs> moderating content will be received by the community and how that might change expectations going forward. So I mean, there's some sort of top level kind of things like that. Um, but I guess um, the other, it's related somewhat to what Yochai was saying earlier, um, in the community communicating expectations and having a code of conduct being part of that, we don't really, actually it was your question too about is there a recipe, right? We don't really say like this is what your code of conduct should look like. We help um, maintainers think about, you know, provide different models, even a template, templates for them to think about, you know, the scope, who is this going to apply to, where will it apply um, without telling you too much about the nuances of open source projects. There are different um, ways that people can contribute within the project. So does it apply to just the comments or does it apply to the pull requests? Does it apply to the issues? You know, these kinds of where within a project are we able to do X, Y, and Z? Um, what happens if there are violations? How can people report violations? Who handles the violations? Um, can I report them privately? Can I report the person who handles the violations? Is there somebody else who can take the re reports if it's about that person? You know, so just helping them to think about all the various things that might come up. Um, I think all of that is pretty applicable to other, um, potentially to other platforms. But my last point before I <laughs> then see to other people, if that's okay, um, thinking about, I was thinking about how this would scale very, very broadly. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, theoretically you could have a project of thousands or I guess even million, millions of contributors on GitHub, but you don't. I mean, usually it's a very small community, relatively speaking, to um, what level of scale we see on platforms like Facebook, which we keep mentioning, so I'll just do that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for them, I don't know. I mean, maybe if there are ways to have communities within the worlds of users on Facebook that sort of are the front lines the way that Wikimedia does, I, I don't know exactly how to where there are things that could work across the board, but that w that's an example to me that seems like, you know, maybe if you take some some elements of what you're doing on Wikimedia and, and having there be this um, way to fragment a little bit the global user base into something a little bit more manageable, then maybe there are some commonalities among the people within that community that can help, um, even if it is something like determining code of conduct even, what, what sort of um, norms would fit those communities that we can all sort of get behind for, you know, this, these kinds of pages on Facebook or something. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think there's an interesting thought experiment of like what would happen if, you know, Facebook took a more, you know, open sort of contributor model to developing policies around, you know, pages. Right or around you know who about following policies around how you show up in the news feed and there's sort of an interesting sort of counterfactual you know thought exercise of sort of what would that look like how would you build the sort of governance model for that you know and how you know how would that play out I think trying to loop this back to some of the things that you were saying earlier Jan about sort of the broader context that we're in there's a lot of pressure on platforms to move quickly um, and you know, I think you can sort of can choose like you, you have like fast quality and cheap and you can pick two. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, I certainly speaking like our processes take a while. I think we end up in a good place because of that. Um, but I think that you sort of, we can identify a lot of best practices. We can identify sort of general themes and like things you, you ought to do. Um, but where you fall on which two of those you want, you're going to end up in, you know, Diff making different choices. If I could just, it's, it's more question, maybe it's a comment, I'm not too sure yet what is it, we'll what it out. is. <laughs> um, so um, I like the GitHub case. It is a structured place. It is very specific in terms of the audience that it's dealing with, um, and it's open source. Um, now, one of the things we do at CIPESA is um, localization exercises, exercises around digital security tools. And quite a bit of the feedback that we get is that some of the tools are not responsive to the needs of communities in the global south. 
And that always makes me wonder, so who makes up the GitHub community? And other people from the Global South, is it that they're not raising some of the issues or they're not? Um, that's a dynamic I've always wondered about because it also plays out in other spaces as well. Um, but in this instance, it's a smaller space, a very a specific community. But what happens with that flow of information? Um, what is taken on board? What isn't, what's the processes around that? Maybe I'm putting you on the spot, but. <laughs> Not at all, but um, really we leave it up to the communities themselves to determine that. So I mean, the platform enables people to, um, I guess, um, describe their project in a way and kind of build the environment in a way that will hopefully attract very diverse communities, very inclusive communities, and we don't, uh, we, we provide plenty of um, recommendations on how to do things like, the, you know, ways that you can be, um, a wel create a welcoming environment, et cetera. Their open source doc guide has a bunch of different guides about creating code of conduct, being, you know, creating welcoming community, all these sorts of things. So there's, there is content in there to help try to generate that, but we ourselves leave it to the communities to determine how they, for their particular project, what they're looking for, and then within those communities, um, I mean, the nature of open source, if you're using, um, if you're doing it publicly, you know, yeah, the nature of building software through an open source um, platform is that things are presented in a way that communities can edit, propose edits, and um, comment on what's there, and so things like a code of conduct and the community, um, even the community guidelines that GitHub puts out there, we put those out there to the community, which is all of our users, millions and 31 million users, I think, who can provide comments to us and say, I, I think that you know, this is unclear or this should also you know, elaborate on another situation or something. And we um, take that into account and we'll revise our, our guidelines. And for communities themselves, that's something that we recommend they do as situations arise and you see problems occur based on what your current code of conduct is, revise the code so that you're you know, trying to anticipate future situations. So I don't know if any of that's really not, not really answering a question, but maybe throwing some things in there that are generally relevant. Yeah. Yes, I'm Mark Nelson from the Center for International Media Assistance. I just wanted to follow up on, on that conversation. For, you know, developing countries and countries in a state of uh, fragility or uh, where ethnic violence is taking place and where online communities are the source of much of that. Um, the real issue is, you know, is there a role for uh, regulation in this, in this? You mentioned that the, the very top level is laws. And I'm just wondering, are there incentives that could be put in place by intelligent government that would make more self-regulation more likely to happen? Because obviously that is not an incentive system we have right now. I mean, the kinds of things you're talking about are still very rare online space at, at a global level. So, you know, it, finding a way to reduce this misgovernance that's going on on the online space around the world is really a critical issue. And regulators, and I, I was just in Ghana talking to the national regulator of the media there, and he says, you know, this is really, really a huge problem for our societies and we don't know what to do. How do we do this? Because there's no way for us to intervene in this way. So they're, of course, they come up with uh, really very bad policies in, in, in the absence of having good ideas. So do you have ideas about what those laws or regulations might be that would be positive incentives for this kind of behavior that you're promoting? Do you want to, I mean, I can do it, but do you want to? Go ahead, I Abby. Um, well, I don't, I don't really have a, you know, exact answer for that one either, but I think, um, you know, we're, we're in a place in the digital age where I think there's some level of regulation that's coming slash here, we're in it, and part of um, my job, and I know others in this room, is working with regulators on technology where you're finding various levels of familiarity with technology. And so I think um, that creates both an opportunity for people who understand the technology and understand the law to make 
um, effective good laws. It also sometimes will result in laws that are maybe well-intentioned, but actually those words aren't achieving what people intend or, or what they're hoping for. And technology often outpaces law. So if you try to be a little you know, too concrete in your law, too specific, that can very quickly become outdated or loopholes can subvert what people were trying to do. So I think um, some level of regulation makes sense. But this is where I think my point earlier was if we can help at the most local level of action, the community level, if we can make that effective, then we help prevent the need for so much um, regulation, regulation at especially at a level that's distant from the users who are creating the content. And um, so, yeah. Um, I kind of want to take a step back here and, and, and um, think about how, how, what you actually mentioned here, um, how room for this, um, for, or even incentivizing such self-governance through laws, through regulation can play out. Um, San Hong, at UNESCO, you, you are involved in, in, um, in the development of the Internet universe, Universality Framework. I wonder whether community self-governance, the room for it, encouraging it, somehow plays into, into that framework and, and how at UNESCO you look at that. Thank you for the for this question, and also I appreciate what has been discussed. Yeah, that also came to my mind. Um, maybe I should start from uh, commenting the challenges that I see. The room quite can be quite limited uh, because whether you could. Uh, I mean, I know the techie, I mean, technical community and maybe knowledge-based uh, platform have, have already gone quite far in having this community-based governance. But uh, you should also be aware why you can go so far, maybe because your platform is operating in a very favorable, conducive national reg regulatory context. It's it won't be easily duplicated maybe in other contexts. There are so many different kind of uh, platforms who are operating in different uh, national contexts. Um, we had a research before to look at the internet, I internet intermediaries liability issue. I mean, one, uh, one result is that, uh, I mean, those platforms, whether they are liable for the content they are hosting, really to a large extent it depends on the national national legal and regulatory framework. That's something you wouldn't be easily change it to make them very much facilitating this community uh, governance. That's uh, one challenge uh, for having more room. And, and another, and related to this, I like to uh, look at through the UNESCO lens of the Internet Universality Framework, because we are called, we are advocating norms which should be applied to the national. Uh, legal and regulatory framework, for example, human rights based. I mean, if we have this national context, uh, I mean, to have an environment uh, very much human rights uh, friendly, uh, you, w whatever a platform operates, you should respect the basic rights of freedom of expression of uh, media, of individuals. And also, in terms of online content, uh, shouldn't we also think about uh, the privacy? I mean, the, if it concern others' um, personal information, that's also another issue. Uh, quite closely to the free expression, that's more complex uh, rights uh, aspect to consider uh, in this community governance as well. Um, and also, uh, also drawing from what we have advocated in the universality principles of internet, I would say to allow more room for this community governance, I would see the media information literacy can be one ingredient fit into your recipe because uh, to look at the users, I mean the community you are talking about, on one hand, you might not have a very um, constructive environment. On the other hand, if you look at the community, they can be very fragmented along many, many borders, along the language, along maybe even national border, and uh, along the culture, and as we just discussed, uh, they won't um, so easily come up into a community to to endorse sort of uh, uh, guidelines and then to take action. And, but on the other side, you see why the countries, the states, now they are so driven to regulate uh, because there are also, also many substantial challenges in, uh, 
for example, to defend the integrity of elections. I mean, the the the, the algorithm are called the call are causing so much uh, echo chamber. I mean, so many issues, so urgent the chance to tackle. Would this community will be inclusive and also eventually can take effective action to tackle that, there also be a challenge for you to have a room for. But I, but all in all, I, I still feel that um, in the uh, digital age, everybody became a, a content producer. They need to, they need a the capacity. There's a, such a gap. We should, we should teach children in the school. Uh, we should um, educate adults I and mean, officers, everybody, individuals, to, to have the uh, new type of literacy to handle the complex information production procedure and also to critically assess information. Eventually, they can. Uh, also be a part of this community to govern, self-govern the content. Yeah, I think um, as you pointed out and also I did in the framing of this session, there are a lot of things to fix on the internet. Um, and and, and <laughs> literacy obviously is a part of that, but um, I think um, also going back to the theme of trust, um, trust also means that you need to give um, users agency, right? That you need to empower them and enable them um, so they can actually help fix platforms fixed internet. Um, Juliet, how, how do you think or how do you, um, in, in the space you observe, how does user agency play out um, in, in different cohorts? Is, is, is there, do you see patterns how communities actually start to work um, when they are enabled or is there, is, there, is there a pattern why they break down when, they're, when, they, when they don't feel agency? I think the opportunity for agency is still threatened in many countries um, uh, that we work in. Um, as has been pointed out, the current laws and regulations really punch at that sense of agency. We have laws that um, criminalize, literally, content being posted online. In a country like Tanzania, you now have to pay to have a blog. Um, Ethiopia has, uh, what, what was it, Egypt decided that if you have more than 5,000 followers, you'll be treated as a media house. And the history of media in that country is not particularly great when it comes to how the state has interacted with them. Um, in Uganda, we also have an online regulation law that, you know, if you're having an online space, you need to be registered with the state. You need to give out your personal information, what you're doing, who is involved with it, and that brings about issues around data privacy. We do not have a data privacy and protection law. Um, then we also did the exciting thing of, you know, um, taxing social media, access to social media. So again, we keep repeatedly punching on uh, the online agency that people would otherwise have, the excitement that they would otherwise have to be part of communities to generate content without the fear of um, being hunted down for whatever it is that they have um, posted. So even though the idea may be there, it is tightly followed with a sense of fear, um, which plays out even in existing spaces. Why are you posting this? Take this down immediately. The police are going to come after you. I do not want to be a part of this group. Um, so that sense of agency is not as strong as it should be, is not as strong as it otherwise is in other parts of um, the world. Um, so as long as we maintain these um, laws and regulations, which perpetuate a sense of fear, perpetuate self-censorship. Um, we're going to remain with a struggle when it comes to organizing um, communities online. But that's not to say it's not happening. Um, it could otherwise be happening on a much bigger scale. Um, when we see a platform like Jami Forums in Tanzania, um, it's an online news, um, well not news, but users generate the content that comes up there. It's also a whistleblower's paradise. If you hear something, go straight there, let people know about it. But the state came after it and its um, owners, the state came after it demanding information about who the people on that site are. Yet it's been playing a very vital role in um, the freedom of expression landscape in the country. Uh, and now it's also one of those sites which has to pay to remain online, but why should it? Um, so we see a lot of affronts to the opportunities that would otherwise enable um, a replication of a Wikimedia, a GitHub in some of the countries in the global south, or at least in East Africa. Yeah, yeah maybe um, 
we have a couple more minutes. Um, I um, just saw yesterday that I think Austria is proposing to um, a law for for um, users to have clear names. Um, is that yeah um, on on social media? Um, anonymity and pseudonymity, I think, are, are very um, important parts of, of of being able to meaningfully engage in a in a in a community. Um, I think I want to um, throw it back to you, Yochai, here. How how does how does that like this ability to speak freely under a pseudonym, maybe an, uh, anonymously, play out in in the communities that you watch? Uh, so. Uh, I think looking at the world broadly, I think we know that the capacity to speak anonymously and pseudonymously is critical to the realization of free expression. There are many parts of the world where, you know, having to use your real name online can get you killed and has gotten people killed, um, has gotten them detained and arrested and in some cases tortured. Um, you know, this is not a academic exercise. Um, and so I think we need to sort of look at that. I think we're a far cry away from the internet being a safe space for all to speak freely online. Um, and I think that that comes in a lot of different flavors. I think part of that is, you know, the tactics uh, of um, countries that do not uphold the, you know, obligations of human rights that I think those of us in the room probably share. Um, and are, you know, establishing international law. I think we see other threats that are perhaps not quite as pointed in terms of authoritarianism, but I think we know that there is an epidemic of harassment online, right? I think we know that many people cannot speak freely, and um, these are real challenges. They are affecting our discourse, they're affecting our society. Um, I don't think that, you know, I think sometimes in an effort to try and do something and recognizing those problems, it's very tempting to say, well, go fix this problem, and we are requiring that you fix, you know, this kind of issue in an hour or in 24 hours. And, you know, that is incredibly challenging. That, that, that kind of legal mandate doesn't solve the problem, you know, in and of itself. Um, so, you know, I think we need, there's a lot of different layers of this, and I think it's really important to sort of disambiguate um, problems, you know, you and I were chatting the hallway, I think yesterday, you know, we were saying like, there are meaningful differences, you know, when we're trying to deal with online harassment versus hate speech versus terrorist content um, versus the sort of the tactics of uh, regimes, you know, for varying degrees of, you, you know, um, objectives, you know, from, from, you know, authoritarian to just trying to maintain order in their communities. Um, and we need to sort of be very specific and, and embrace some of that nuance. Um, I think sort of three sort of questions that I'll sort of leave to sort of, you know, from the user's perspective, what would it take to reach someone with power? You know, when, when you, you know, see content that either is harming you or that you think is harmful in general, what are the steps that you have to go through and what does it take to reach someone who actually has the power to do something about it? Um, I think there's a second question of for the people who flag things incorrectly or that do not comport with, you know, your understanding of guidelines in terms of service and, and the law itself, what education are you giving to those people back to say, like, this was not a good flag? Um, and how do you sort of help to raise the level of understanding within the ecosystem that way? And, uh, you know, sir, you sort of said, um, that you know a lot of the trouble comes from online communities and online discussions. I think that online discussions reflect our society, reflect societal divisions, and there's a lot of you know area you know of things that bad behavior that we see online, which does rise to a level of crime, but we don't actually see a whole lot of prosecution for online crimes. And so yes, it's tempting to go tell platforms, go fix this. Um, but I think that there are, you know, other areas where we need partners in this space. You know, this takes a whole village of folks to try and, and to make the internet, you know, a safer, more secure, um, you know, more open place. Literally a community, right. You see how, you see how I just served that one up for you? Yeah, wait. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. This worked really well. Um, so we're almost at time. Um, I just want to go through the room. Are there any questions, um, comments that you'd like to share? Otherwise, I'll um, give the mic to, um, to Anna to do a quick wrap-up conclusions. 
Anybody? Yeah, it's early. Okay. No? Good. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Yohai. I think you did half of, <laughs> of the wrap up for us. Um, um, just to quickly bring the, the, the key points, because I think we talked um, uh, about uh, sort of all levels of, of where that, uh, uh, condi where the conditions should happen so that we really can ensure that uh, communities really have power, really have governance. Um, uh, first of all, we talked about the preparedness of the communities to do that, of how they self-educate, how they enter discussions, how they line out their uh, rules of engagement so that they are inclusive and open. And we had different models from GitHub through Wikimedia to um, uh, also Mozilla to attest to that. On the other hand, there is a question of preparedness of platforms. How well are they prepared to, um, uh, to actually assist those processes? And uh, we saw clearly that uh, the effect, the, the, the good effect of their involvement is where they provide guidelines and support even in terms of providing templates and, and, um, and some sort of education uh, to the users so that they can understand better uh, what are the conditions and, and, um, and how to not self-censor and self-police, but to really constructively moderate content so that it's on one hand safe, but on, on the other hand also courageous and, uh, and real to people's hearts. Um, then we talked, so basically the issue of empowering users. And we also saw uh, a bit of a tension between that empowerment and the fact that we want to talk about governance but also we brought up the fact that platforms are uh, private spaces. They are privately owned very, op uh, very often. And, uh, and the tension is between how they want to set out in a way, in, a, in an authoritarian way, uh, the terms of conditions of engagement with content and with other users, and to, to what extent they actually uh, delegate some of those risks to the users, and to what extent they actually can allow the governance. And we were also wondering whether the, uh, uh, the models that we talked about are really adaptable from platform to platform and what they require. Uh, and on top of that, we of course have governments uh, that have different ideas. So for global platforms, this is also a challenge to kind of meet all the requirements in all different geography geographies, but also that are not uh, sometimes very well prepared to deal with, um, with uh, those issues. And we spoke about the Burmese example where uh, where that failed uh, not only uh, because there were no moderators that could actually engage with content in the language, but also because of the government's inability to, or, or even assistance to, the, uh, uh, to this hate drive that happened also in real life. Uh, but also we talked about the fact that the governments want to uh, 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 attack the issues at their end, sort of. So, for example, they um, uh, 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 try to tinker the, the uh, anonymity, which we know is crucial in many parts of the world for users to be able to meaningfully engage with each other uh, or uh, to try to set out laws that uh, fix the symptoms in, instead of the problems. And, of course, one of the challenges is how to make sure that on uh, a level where we can actually uh, look uh, globally on those issues, such as the frameworks of UNESCO and multi-stakeholder envir uh, environments, how we can actually meaningfully set out ideas that attack the issues, also those that come out from the, the way the platforms operate and how they want to deal with liability, and not only at the end where the users are and, uh, and where those laws can potentially backfire. I hope I captured Wonderful, most you. of it. Well, and we're at time, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this morning for this conversation. Thanks to my speakers and to my co-organizers. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.